Well, good morning. Great to have everybody here. What a beautiful day. Wonderful to be, be here in the Lord's house and be able to worship with fellow believers. Has God been good to you? No, I mean, has God been good to you? Uh, amen. Uh, is he still on the throne and still in control? Amen. Are you glad that you're saved? Not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, but because we're sinners saved by the grace of God. Amen. Hey, man, let's go ahead and stand. We're going to sing some songs. We're going to do a hymn here to start with. Complete in thee. Let's go ahead and stand, please. And let's sing out together from our hearts. Think about the words of the song as we sing. to bring you back 
That's one of those songs that kind of brings me back. I was ra I was born and raised back in in Galena Township, Indiana, and a uh, little GRB church that was there. And uh, I remember my grandmother and grandfather. I remember standing next to them and singing that song. And what a what a great uh, message that song has. Um, as we go to the Lord in prayer today, the number of folks we need to pray for. I'm probably not going to hit all of them, but uh, I'll hit as many as I can. How about that? Um, we need to be playing, praying for the Huerta family. Uh, Brother Jamie uh, and his family aren't able to be here today. He threw his back out, and so he's not able to be here with us today. And then uh, Larry Doyle, as well, is traveling, helping his son move, so he won't be here today either. But let's pray that he has uh, traveling safety for he and those that are moving uh, in that moving group. And then uh, a couple other ones. Um, Jerry Gray uh, is home today. She... Uh, uh, has a nasal, a bad nasal infection, and she's unable to be here with us uh, this morning. And then uh, Tom, is it Hughie? Is that how it? Yes, okay, Tom. Tom uh, has, uh, well, he had COVID, and they've, they've now uh, brought in hospice. He's not doing well at all, and his wife has it as well. So we just be praying for them. I know they would appreciate that. And then uh, also uh, Paul and Kathy had asked me to pray for their nephew, whose name is Shannon. We've been praying for him, uh, but he, uh, they took him off a ventilator, and he coded. And so now his condition is a lot more serious. So if we just be praying for them. A lot of folks that are sick, a lot of folks that are struggling with things today. And uh, let's go ahead and take all that and set it aside. How about that? We'll just go ahead and leave it at the foot of the cross this morning. And I know that's the best place for it because we have a God that can do great things. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Ask the Lord to watch over us in our service today. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to meet in your house. Lord, I know there are many of our, our members, Lord, that are going through things today, Lord, that are struggling. Lord, I pray you be with each and every one of them that we've mentioned. Lord, watch over them. Bring them, Lord, to better health. Lord, those that we've heard this morning that are even struggling for life, Lord, I pray that you would just be with the doctors and the nurses and give them the wisdom they need to make the right choices and decisions and recommendations to their family. Lord, to the family members that are stressed and wore out with the long process that's taken place, I pray that you would, Lord, lift them up and bolster them. Lord, if there are Christians that are near them and around them, I pray that you would lift them up. And, Lord, allow them to be a good example to those that are struggling. Father, I pray that you would uh, continue, Lord, to uh, watch over our church family. Lord, we have some that are traveling today. I think of Brother Larry in particular. Lord, keep them safe. Watch over them. But Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd allow us to come into your house this morning, Lord, and set aside the issues and circumstances that are uh, taking place in our daily lives. And would we allow your Holy Spirit to use the word of God, whether through song, Lord, through the message, Lord, to be planted deeply in our hearts and to bring us the resource we need today to be able to get through this week and to live strong Christian lives for thee. Father, we thank you for this country. Lord, there's so much that's going on. Lord, we pray for our president. Lord, we pray that you keep him safe, keep him rested. Lord, be with our Senate as well. Father, I know, Lord, that there are many decisions that are being made that do not square with your word. Lord, may all those that are in authority remember that their true authority comes from you. And Father, I pray that you'd work in their hearts. Those that are unsaved, may they come to the knowledge of your Savior and understand the true liberty and freedom that we have in you. Be with our soldiers, those that are in harm's way. Keep them safe. Watch over them. Watch over their families as they are away from them. Lord, keep them safe as well. Once again, Father, thank you very much for being with us this morning. We pray that your Holy Spirit would have free reign. In thy precious Son's name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Why don't you be seated for this next song? Our church, we do uh, a number of things. Basically, we do older songs. We do uh, hymns, but we also do contemporary songs. So uh, just once again, these next couple songs, sing from your heart. Think of the Word of God. Let the Word of God flow rich.
stand with us for our final song today. King of Kings. Chance for us to remember that we serve the King of Kings. that one more time, that chord, just a cappella. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, praise forever to the King of kings. Awesome singing this morning. You may be seated.
have the children be dismissed. Those are sixth grade and below. Go to Children's Church. I know a number of the kids are already back in their Children's Church class. The rest of us take our Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Usually I read a or tell a joke or whatever to get started this morning. Um, I'm going to read to you some actual quotes from employee performance evaluations. You ever, you ever have an evaluation at your work? huh? And they go ahead and they write in basically what the, your supervisor write in what they think at the end. Well, these are what some of the people who, who were uh, the supervisors, what they wrote about the people they were interviewing or the people they were uh, evaluating. First one says, since my last report, this employee has reached rock bottom and has started to dig. <laughs> Number two, I would not allow this employee to reproduce. <laughs> that is particularly harsh. Uh, number three, this associate is not really much, so much of a has-been, but more of a definitely won't ever be. This young lady has delusions of adequacy. <laughs> the fifth one, this one kills me, works well when under constant supervision and cornered like a rat in a trap. <laughs> uh, when she opens her mouth, it seems that this is only to change whichever foot was previously in there. <laughs> Number seven, he sets low personal standards and then constantly fails to achieve them. <laughs> Last two. This employee is depriving a village somewhere of an idiot. <laughs> Number nine, this employee should go far. And the sooner he starts, the better. <laughs> oh. We're going to begin a new series this morning. Um, we'll do this next few weeks here, but we're going to do a short series on the transformed life. Uh, if you're in there, Romans chapter 12. Um, the transformed life. Uh, you ever like, uh, my wife likes these, and I get drug into them once in a while. But on Saturdays or whatever else, they have these home makeover shows. You ever see those? Anybody else watch those? Yeah, okay. Some of these, some of these, there ought to be like a support group for the people like that. I'm talking about for the husbands or wives that have to deal with the people that are actually uh, attached to those. But my wife and my daughter and my daughter-in-law, they'll sit and they'll watch these like, ooh, that's great. Like, this guy has, like, no job whatsoever, but he's buying a $1.4 million house. You know, and it just is, it's just not going to work for them. You know, they've got to go ahead and change things over. Um, do you realize that the Lord Jesus Christ desires to change you and I? Now, I truly believe this, that the outside may be what man sees, but what does God see? He sees the heart. But can I ask you just to remember something? I believe that our churches ought to be open to everyone, regardless of how much money they make, regardless of what they wear. We don't have a dress code here. We want you to come, and we want you to be fed. But can I remind us of something? That God wants to change us from the inside out. He doesn't just desire to change us on the inside. I'm afraid in some of our churches, that's where we've stopped. That's kind of the pinnacle. We say, well, as long as you love Jesus, that's all that's important. I do believe this, that if you truly fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and you let him into your life, he will change you from the inside out. The outside is going to change. Now, I know in some of our churches that means that somehow, somehow we, that I'm talking about dress standards. I'm really not. What I'm talking about is our outlook, our attitude, our demeanor, how we treat one another. All those things ought to be reflective of the change that's taken place on the inside of us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 12, let's go ahead and read the first three verses here. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Notice verse number two, which is where our text is today. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good an acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. 
Every one of us, the Lord has a plan for us. God has a plan for your life. The Lord isn't, he's not just content to say, I've saved you. He has saved us so that we might serve him. We are not saved to sit, we are saved to serve. We are to be an example in this world, a testimony in this world of the grace of God in action. And each one of us carries that responsibility. Now, your pastor, I believe, ought to be setting a, a higher example of that. I think Scripture commands that of a pastor. But I do believe this, that the pastor is simply to be an example, yes, of the Lord Jesus Christ, albeit a poor one many times. But that doesn't mean that you should be any less or any more. We ought to all be the kind of example we need to be everywhere we go. We don't simply unshoulder that responsibility when we're finished with church on Sunday. We carry that responsibility with us everywhere we go and everything that we do. I only have two points this morning. All God's people said, amen. 50 sub points, but I only have two points. Number one, if we are going to be truly be transformed, there needs to be a proper sacrifice. In the back of your bulletin, it does have a fill-in-the-blank thing there. If you'd like to do that, you feel free to follow along with that. There needs to be a proper sacrifice. When Jesus Christ comes in, he changes us from the inside out, but we need to have, once again, on the inside, that living sacrifice. Verse number one, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Let's just think about this for a moment. First of all, letter A underneath this, their salvation is the foundation stone of this transformation. Paul is writing to the people of Rome here, to the church that's at Rome, and he said, I want you to understand that your salvation is the foundation stone of of this transformation. I grew up in a uh, Baptist churches, but I grew up in a very, very hard right type of Baptist church. And growing up there, I was really saddened as I grew up. Many times you saw the kids that they turn 18 and all of a sudden they just kind of like sprung. It was like, you know, running away, running, get as far away from church as they can if they were in church at all. And truthfully, we need to be careful that as Christians that we don't simply focus on the exterior. The Christian life is not a series of don'ts. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't curse. I don't run around with loose people. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life should also be about the things that we do. But most importantly, can I wrap it up on all this whole thing? This is why many of those kids would be sprung like this is because they were do's and don'ts, but they were never are. I am a Christian first. I know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. You see, I'm, as our church is concerned, we're, we're three years old as a church. My goal has never been to change how you look. Now, some of you, maybe that might be something you want to consider, but like, I, that's not my goal. <laughs> some of you, that was a joke for some of you, I'm sorry. Uh, that's not my goal. My goal isn't to change how you look. Some churches, that is. That's their goal. My goal isn't necessarily even to change how you act. My goal is that, that we as, as a church, as Cross Point Baptist Church, would have a love for the Lord Jesus Christ that's so deep that it compels us to serve him. That we are excited about the change that's taken place on the inside. And that fellowship with him is so sweet and so wonderful that we want everybody in the world to know that they can have that too. We want them to have the kind of love of the Lord Jesus Christ inside their heart and soul to the point that, you know what, they can't help but allow it to change the outside. It just comes naturally. But it starts at our salvation. Romans, if you go back here, we of course, we're looking at this verse. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. You know, whenever you see the word therefore or wherefore, what does that mean? Some of you have been in the church for a while. You know, you already kind of, go ahead and say it out loud. It's okay. Back up. Okay, so if I could teach you that, whenever you're going through Scripture, you see the word therefore or wherefore, that means back up. He is completing a thought. He has painted a picture, and now he wants us to step back and look at it in its entirety. 
So let's go back to Romans chapter 11. Let's read the six verses in Romans chapter 11, verses 30 through 36. What had Paul just told them? He says, For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so have also these now not, 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 uh, now not believed, that through your mercy they may also obtain mercy. He's basically saying somebody gave you the gospel. Somebody brought the gospel to you. What a blessing that is. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ wants to save every individual? He didn't just die for rich people, praise God. He didn't just die for tall people, praise the Lord. He didn't just die for good-looking people, amen. Um, he died for each and every one of us. He goes on to say, verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, exclamation point. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed to him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. What was Paul trying to say? He says, you ought to thank God that he saved your soul. And how he can save someone and transform them is beyond me. I can't understand it. You see, people can argue about whether or not the Bible's true, whether it was written by man or written by God. They can argue about what church they go to. They can argue about a lot of different things when it comes to church politics, but they cannot argue with a changed life. They cannot argue when you see someone who was a drunkard, someone who was a drug addict, someone whose marriage was falling apart, and Jesus Christ comes in and their life is changed. You can't argue that. Because it, 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 it's that divine influence reflected upon the heart. Can I ask you a question this morning? Have you been converted? Hmm? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? It's been said that many people will die separated from God forever for a matter of 16 to 18 inches. The knowledge of Jesus Christ as compared to the possession of of Jesus Christ. You see, in God's family, there are no grandchildren. I love my grandkids. We had a birthday party for Kiara last, yesterday. Gave her, you know, the big cake. Aria, when she had the cake, she didn't want to, she didn't want to get messy. And she's almost asking for a fork. <laughs> she's one years old. She wanted to do it. Kiara put her whole face in it. Just like, <laughs> she was gnawing on that cake, man. I mean, it was all over her face. <laughs> Try to take it away from her. She's like, ah, pure sugar. As, as grandpa, my my house is the is the place of yes. Can you do that? Yes. I got, my neighbors are here. Ed and Jean are, uh, Jan are here today, and uh, my house it is it's my grand. I live with my grands. I love my grandkids. But you only realize something in God's family there are no grandchildren. So what are you saying? My children had to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior on their own. Just because their dad was a pastor didn't mean they were going to heaven. Just because they were born into a Christian home didn't mean they were going to heaven. You say, people don't believe that. There are denominations that teach that. There are people, even sitting in this room, I know your story, that you were raised in a Christian family, but nobody ever told you that you had to personally accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. This church won't save you, by the way. It can't save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you. But sadly, I think there are some in our churches, and the Bible teaches this, that there are tares among the wheat. Huh? See, what's a tare? A tare looks like a grain of, of, of harvest, but it has no fruit. It looks good. It looks similar to a grain of wheat, but it doesn't have any fruit to it. It's a weed. Jesus said, just like that, there are those in our churches that are going to be tares among the wheat. They look good. You maybe even can't tell the difference between them and the real thing. But when it comes down to the fruit, they're missing the fruit. Everything in the Christian life is a struggle for them. They have to work at being a Christian. As compared to, once again, letting the inside out. 
Letting Jesus Christ on the inside shine through on the outside. Have you been converted? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? There is no greater question that you can answer. You say, Pastor, I've been going to church all my life. That's not what I'm asking you. Do you know Jesus Christ personally as your Savior? Has there been a time in your life when you personally realized that you were a sinner and could not make it to heaven on your own? That you, without Jesus Christ, without any way to escape it, you were bound for hell as a payment for your sins. But at some point you realized that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and you asked him to be your Savior. You see, that's salvation. Say, I prayed a prayer one time, Pastor. You know there's no magic prayer that's going to save you? I get, I get fearful sometimes of that. Huh? I've helped people in their prayer life. I've helped them to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. But the reality is, I can't save you. And there's no magic words that can save you. It has to be where? In the heart. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There must be that point when you realize that Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again for your salvation. And then there's more than just understanding that. There must be the calling out to him and ask him to be your savior. Say, so why are we talking about this right now, pastor? Because we have to understand, verse number one, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You have to go back to that salvation experience in order to realize the transformation that needs to take place. Otherwise, you are simply conforming to Christianity. You are not transformed into Christianity. You understand the difference? In other words, conforming the idea of being molded into what looks like as compared to transformed, literally it comes from the, uh, a Greek word that's used. Metamorphosis is a word that's used. Transformation. What else is metamorphosized? Anybody, we do a science class this morning. Moss, go with moss or butterflies, huh? What? Toads. Let's go with butterflies. That's prettier, huh? Toads, toads, not toes. Some of you are like toes. I knew a lady had her toes cut off, like halfway cut off. She went in and had them painted on, like she had toenails on the half of her toe that was left. She was a lady who was really funny. How do we get on toes? We're not talking about toes. We're talking about toads. And we're talking about butterflies. Metamorphosis. What happens? That caterpillar goes into the cocoon, right? It doesn't come out looking the way it did. It comes out something beautiful. But it has to go into that cocoon, that cocoon to become that. That's that word transform that is used in verse number two. Metamorphosis. Christian, you and I. When we go through that salvation experience, it's then that we become transformed. We can't do it on our own. We have to go into that state in order to have this be true. Let it be. Their salvation should produce a sacrifice, a sacrifice life. That salvation, once again, should produce a sacrificed life. We are to be a living sacrifice, the Scripture says. Right? Teach you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now think about that word sacrifice. It would be used in the mindset of religion. In the Jew's mind, Paul's mind. Sacrifice, once again, is that which is dedicated to God, right? Completely his. That lamb that was sacrificed on the altar had no life of its own, it would have to die upon the altar, right? In order to be the sacrifice, to be consumed. Paul says, I don't want you to die a sacrifice. I want you to live a sacrifice. I want every day you to understand that, that transformation, that spiritual salvation experience should produce a living sacrifice. I have certain people in history that are, 
I don't say heroes, but they're people that I look up to greatly, especially when it comes to Christianity. There's a man and a woman by the name of David and Mary Livingston. David Livingston, of course, he's very well-known, even taught in secular realms as an explorer of Africa. Dr. Livingston, I presume, anybody ever heard that? Huh? Stanley said that when he found David Livingston out in the remote jungles of Africa. Let me read you a couple things about them. Mary Livingston had a difficult life. She, of course, was the wife of David Livingston. But she was also the daughter of Robert Moffat. Robert Moffat was the missionary who came back to England and preached and inspired David Livingston to go to Africa. The Livingstons were married in Africa in 1845. But the years that followed were very difficult for Mary in bearing of children as well as disease. Finally, it got to the point that she and their six children returned to England so that she could recuperate as Livingston, David Livingston plunged deeper into the continent of Africa. Unfortunately, even while she was in England and her husband was faithfully serving in the ministry in Africa, Mary lived near the poverty level, very rarely being able to have money to provide as she wanted to for her family. The hardships and long separation finally took its toll on Mrs. Livingston, who died at the age of 42 years old. They talked to David Livingston towards the end of his life. David Livingston, who spent most of his life in Africa. This is what David Livingston had to say about the sacrifices that he made. He says, people talk of the sacrifices I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa and deprivation. Can that be called a sacrifice, which is simply acknowledging a great debt we owe to God, which we can never repay? Is it a sacrifice which brings its own reward? Rather, I would say it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, danger, foregoing the common conveniences of this life, these may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver or the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these things are nothing compared to the glory which shall later be revealed in and through us. And then he makes this statement. I never made any sacrifice. Of this we ought not to talk when we remember the great sacrifice which he made, who left his father's throne on high to give himself for us. We need to be a living sacrifice. And rather than bemoan our existence and the things that we can't do, we need to embrace the fact of that which we are. We are to be a living sacrifice, but also, number two, we are to, be, we are to live holy. And we know what the word holy means? Without sin. Huh? Without sin. We seem to have forgotten that in our day and age. In our zeal to have big buildings and to have massive crowds, we've forgotten what it means to preach against sin and preach about the holiness of the God of heaven. Remember in Isaiah chapter 6, as the angels fly around the throne of God himself, do you remember what they cry out? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Without sin, without sin, without sin is what they cried. Holy, holy, holy. Has our salvation produced a life without sin? Number three, we are to provide the Lord an acceptable or useful sacrifice. We are to provide the Lord an acceptable or usable sacrifice. I love how he puts this in this verse. He says, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Where would you and I be without Jesus Christ today? Huh? What would our life be like without Christ? Empty. Huh? Without hope. 
The only thing we could enjoy is that which we get in this life without ever the joy of knowing that in the hereafter we will be rewarded by him as well as we will be reunited with our loved ones as we see him face to face. Think of all that Jesus Christ suffered to bring us salvation. The pain that he experienced with his betrayal and his crucifixion. He did all of that for you and I. What kind of ungrateful people we must seem sometimes when we tell that Savior, I'm too busy to live for you today. When we fail to realize that we need to remark to him many times over, thank you, God, for what you've done for me. Those that know my story know the fact that I had two and a half years of my life that I didn't darken the door of church. I grew up in church, as I told you, a far right, conservative, hardline type of church. About destroyed my family. I have a brother that's dead today as a result of the experiences of the things that we went through. I was mad at God and mad at church. How do you call that Christianity? I walked away from church for over two years of my life. There's not a day in my life now that I don't think back and regret that some of the decisions that I made. But I also remember when I gave my life back to the Lord. 29 years ago, I remember sitting in a church, in a church service and the pastor speaking about how God wants to use you, how God has a plan for your life. And I remember just sitting there saying, not me. Not me. See, I knew what I had done. I knew how I lived. But when I came down to the altar and I gave my life back to God 29 years ago, I promised him that I would not look back. There was nothing to look back for. Say, why? Those two and a half years were the most empty two and a half years of my life. I literally remember sitting on the edge of the bed, contemplating, slitting my wrists, and just dying. I was so miserable away from God. There's not a day that goes by that I don't thank him for the change that he made in my life. There's not a day that doesn't go by that I don't realize I don't deserve to stand behind this pulpit and preach his word after what I've been, what I've done. I'm thankful for what God has done for me. How about you? Huh? Didn't it just stand to reason that we would give him our life back after what he's done for us? It's your reasonable service. It's the acceptable service that we ought to have. We are not to give this grudgingly. We're not to give this grudgingly. You ever tell your kids to tell them, tell their sibling they're sorry? Tell them you're sorry. Sorry. When my kids were real little, give them a hug. <laughs> like, yeah, all right, whatever. Not really coming from the heart, you know what I'm saying? We ought to give to God, not grudgingly. We ought to be eager to give to him. Lord, what more do you want from me? What more do you want? going through the book of Philippians and on Wednesday night for our Bible studies at 7 we meet here we're going to talk about the Apostle Paul where he comes to verse number 21 in Philippians chapter 1 and he says for, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain would to God that all of us as God's children would have that mindset say my sole goal in life is not to make money my sole goal in life is not to have riches. My sole goal in life is not to have fame. My sole goal in life is to live every day, every moment for my Savior. And if I die in the process, that's okay too. Pastor, I don't want to I don't want to burn out. I think as most Christians today, we have a greater fear of rusting out than we do burning out. <laughs> Number 2. There's a proper mindset. A proper mindset. Verse number two and three. Be not conformed to this world, 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Letter A here, it's commanded to not conform to this world's thinking. We are commanded not to conform to this world's thinking. I'm not going to take a great deal of time because I've already talked to you about the difference between conforming and transformation. But literally the word conform that's used here in the Greek language literally means to put on the form, fashion, or appearance of. Now, I don't believe that, once again, it's the external things that define us. But it is the external things of what the world sees of us. Where we go, how we talk, what we do is what they know of us. It's been said that you and I as Christians may be the only Bible that some people read. This is why the Bible says, ye are the light of the world. Right? Right? We ought not to conform to this world. This world that he's talking about here, literally that word world that's used means the maxim habits and feelings of the current generation. This is why 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 says this, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. For the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We ought not to be in love with the things of this world. Not, not to be conformed to it, but transformed. Also, it is a total transformation that is necessary in the life of a true Christian. So what are you saying? We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Amen? Stay with me. you got about two minutes here, all right? Stay with me. We're going to put in the overdrive here. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. If you say, Pastor, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I have truly accepted him. Then there ought to have been at that moment of transformation the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that would be that other little voice now that's telling you that that's sin and this is righteousness. If you don't have that, I would question whether or not you genuinely have salvation. Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Very specific, old things are passed away. What was important to us before our salvation is no longer as important as that which God has for us today. That's how it should be. We are new creatures, a new creation. But we also, number two, are reminded repeatedly to put on this new man. See, what does that mean, Pastor? If we're commanded to put it on, that means it's possible for us to go around without it. We need to be reminded of the fact that this is what ought to be taking place in the life and heart of a true Christian. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. Verse 23, and being renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on, what? The new man, which after God is created in righteousness and what? True holiness. Here it is again. Almost mere passages, aren't they? Put off the old, put on the new. That's what a child of God should do. And that new that he puts on ought not to mirror the best Christian that they know. It ought to mirror the word of God. It ought to mirror the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a new man, that Holy Spirit of God that comes in and changes us. See, why? Because number three, we are to live this new life before all. We are to live this new life before all. And prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There was a young woman that asked for an appointment with her doctor, or rather her pastor. She said she had this besetting sin that always caused her problems. 
She said, Pastor, I become aware of the sin that's in my life I can't control. Every time I'm at church, I begin to look around at the other ladies that are there, and I realize that I'm the prettiest and smartest one in the whole congregation. None of the others can compare to my beauty or my brains. What can I do about this besetting sin? The pastor replied, Mary, that's not a sin. Why, that's just what we call a mistake. <laughs> You're not the brightest. You're not the prettiest. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Chapter 6, verse number 14. And God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. That is the transformation to holiness and to godliness. So what do we need today? Two things. Number one, we need to have an honest assessment about our pride. An honest assessment absent of pride, rather. An honest assessment of our life absent of pride. Pride can get in the way. <laughs> it's been said that pride is the only disease that makes everyone sick but the one who has it. It's true. There's a heavyweight boxer by the name of James Tillis. Fought his way up the ranks, and when he left Oklahoma and began his journey, he brought his suitcases, and he came to Chicago. And he looked up at Chicago, and he set his suitcases down in front of him and looked up at the front of the Sears Tower, and he said, this is a quote from him, he said, I looked at the tower, and I said to myself, I'm going to conquer Chicago. He said, when I looked down, my suitcases were gone. Sometimes life gets away from us. This is why verse 3 says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, all of us, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Huh? We are nothing without Jesus Christ. We cannot do the Christian life without him. We cannot be that light in this dark world without having that relationship. So number two here, we need to measure our spirituality according to God's plan for us individually. What's God's plan for you? Well, I don't know what it is. I have people come to my office once in a while and they want me to tell them what God's will is. I don't know. I'm not God. I don't know what God's plan is for your life. Teenagers, God has a plan for you in your life. I don't know what it is. Young adults, God has a plan for your life. I can't tell you what it is, but I can promise you he does have a plan. For those that are my age, God still has a plan for us. Those that are much older than I am, God even has a plan for you. Huh? He's not finished with any of us. No matter where we're at in this stage of life, God still has a plan. Let me encourage you, find that plan. Find out what it is. Let the Holy Spirit dwell richly in you. Fall in love with Jesus as you should, and he will change you from the inside out. And you and I will be transformed in this world. All God's people said. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing it is to be able to meet again in your house. May you watch over us now. I'm going to ask you just a couple quick questions. Your heads bowed and eyes closed. We're not going to have an invitation this morning as such. But I do want to ask you just some couple quick questions. The first one, most importantly, is do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Right there in your seat, I want you to ask yourself, have I had that transformation experience that he was talking about? Have I received the new man inside of me? Or am I just trying to make the old man, the sinful nature of our life, conform to Christianity? I wonder if there'd be one here today that'd say, Pastor Crawford, pray for me this morning. This area of my life troubles me. I'm not certain that I'm a Christian. I'm not certain I've had that transformation experience. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? No one's looking around. Just between you and the Lord, 
that you'd say, Pastor, pray for me this morning. Let me ask you this as well then. Those that said, yes, I know that I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I wonder how many this morning would say, Pastor, as we close in prayer, would you pray for me that I will truly let Jesus Christ transform me each and every day? That I will not be conformed to this world. I want to be transformed, as Paul spoke of. Would you slip your hand up and let me pray for you? Amen. Hands all over the room. Praise the Lord. You may put your hands down. I'll pray for you in just a moment. Remember something. My prayer isn't going to change your life. I'll pray for you. But the devil will try to keep you from living that kind of life. That's why we need to walk in the Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit empower you this week. Let him show you how to live that life. in True righteousness and true holiness. Heavenly Father, be with these who lifted their hands. I pray, dear God, that you would speak to our hearts individually. Help us to be that which we should be before thee. Lord, if there one that is here today that does not know you as Savior, maybe they were too nervous or afraid to raise their hand. Lord, whoever they may be that's struggling, may you help them to settle that question. Lord, to be able to trust in you with their entire heart, soul, and mind. Thank you, dear God, for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for the salvation that you've given to us. Be with us now. In thy precious son's name we pray. Amen. All right, well, the kids will come back in here in just a minute. Until they do, we'll have the ushers prepare to take our offering today. A couple things that I want to mention just while they're doing that. Um, there's some clothes that are out here on this table back by the church mailboxes. It's for Mel Trotter. We've been collecting for a couple weeks here. If you have some clothes, make sure they're nice clothes. Okay, don't, I, I don't want to wear this anymore because it's all tore up. Throw it away. Don't give it to Mel Trotter. Uh, but if you have some nice clothes, gently used, bring them in. They can use those. Uh, there is a list there on the table as well of what they're looking for. Grab that. And at the end of this month, Barb Henry, where's Barb at? She's back around here somewhere. Um, she'll be helping. She and some others will be taking it over to Mel Trotter. We want to be a blessing to them. Make sure that uh, you see her if you'd like to go ahead and get some more information about that. There are also some books that are back there. I had a pastor who uh, moved, and basically he left his books uh, behind. Uh, well, some of them are very good books. They're, they're also on these tables back there. They are free. So if you'd like to go by and, and look at them, pick out maybe one that interests you, you can have it, take it home. Whatever isn't taken by the end of this month, we're going to take it down uh, to a bo local bookstore and let somebody else go ahead and uh, take it and use it. All right. Uh, I think that's all that I've got. I'm sorry, I lose my voice here. I'll should have you make your way forward. We'll receive the offering this morning. I encourage you to give from your heart as God directs you. I don't look at tithing statements. I have no idea what you give. I don't care what you give. That's between you and the Lord. Uh, but I do believe this, that God does know, and he does care what you give. 10% belongs to God. I saw, yeah, 100% does. He just wants 10% back. Uh, I saw in that box of books, there was a, a old, old card. It was like a pamphlet that said, why tithe? I was like, well, that's interesting. So I started to through it, and I'm like, hey, you've got some pretty good points. It was written by a Presbyterian pastor in his church. It wasn't even Baptist, and he believed in tithing. How about that? Huh? Once again, tithe, that's a Christian thing, not a, not a Baptist thing. We give to the Lord because we invest in that which will last for eternity. I encourage you to remember that. Brother Steve Sano, would you lead us in a word of prayer for the offering, please? Amen. A uh, number of things that I want to mention here. There is one that's not on here as well. Uh, Christina. Where's Christina? Christina is getting married here in a couple months, and then we're going to have a, a bridal shower. I say we, I mean you. Uh, I'm not going to a bridal shower. I don't do bi bi bridal showers or baby showers. That's weird for a guy to go. I don't want to go. I'll go shooting. I'm going to do something like that. Do, go fishing. Do some manly stuff. There we go. Anyway, but the ladies, they like to do those kind of things, and it's important. We go ahead and encourage her. Make sure you mention. I want to mention that it's on the 25th. It'll be right after the Sunday morning service. They have a qu quick meal or whatever else. No, it's 26th, right? 25th? 25th, okay. 
All right, number of things that are on here. Once again, worship team practice today. If you're on the worship team, uh, we do have food for you here. You stick around, and uh, we'll practice for about an hour, so we have our songs down. Uh, this past week, thank you for those that came out to the Wednesday night Bible study. I just want to tell you, we had a great crowd out, uh, both in both groups. Um, I'm teaching a, a book of a book of Philippians, going verse by verse through the book of the Philippians, uh, in a small group setting out here in the foyer. And Brother Jamie is teaching his tall law class here. Um, encourage you once again, make your way out to that. All of us need extra Bible reading, Bible studying. So let me encourage you to come and be a part of that this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. Then there's a couple other things there. Safety meeting uh, next week, and then civil servants outreach as well. That'll be taking place. All right, I think that's it. Let's go ahead and stand. I want to thank you for coming today. Have a worship team come back up here, sing a song. We're going to sing a different song today called I'll Live for Jesus. Anybody know this song? Yeah, feel good. Make sure you sing out nice and loud for this. But I'll live for Jesus day after day. What a great song to be reminded of today. Once again, hang on a second, Brenda. I uh, just want you to know I have an open-door policy. If you need to ask me anything or you want to talk to me, you can always make an appointment do that. Or you can text me or email me, whatever it is that you choose to do. I love being your pastor. Nothing else in this world I'd rather than being the pastor of Cross Point Baptist Church. Thank you for allowing me to be your pastor. Thank you for allowing my wife and I to serve here in this ministry, my daughter, my son as well. We, want to, we love you folks, really do. And I know that you pray for me. Many of you will throughout the week let me know that. Thank you so much. I do covet your prayers and uh, so thankful. God is doing a great work here at Cross Point. I know we have a lot of folks that aren't here today, but we have a lot of folks. we got a good crowd this morning. God is continuing to bless. We're continuing to pray about a new building. I want to mention that as well. We'll continue to pray about that. The building we looked at originally up on Porter, we're not going to go that route. Uh, but we are looking at where the Lord has. I believe God could still give us a building. This, this, those that don't know, this is rented for four years. We're about uh, two and a half years into it. So we've about a year and a half to decide what we're going to do. Uh, but we are able to stay here too. Our, our landlord said stay as long as you want. So we know we're not in a rush or in a hurry. But I believe God can do anything he wants to do. Uh, some people say, well, I don't know if we can get a new building. Why don't you just borrow some of my faith? It's okay. God, God wants to go ahead and do great things. really does. And I believe God will do it if we'll have the faith to go ahead and put our trust in him. So let's just go ahead and keep praying, keep giving, and uh, keep, keep that smile on our face. God's going to do great things for our church. I really believe that. God bless you. Thank you for coming today. Uh, enjoy, this, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.